Okay, we're here on the Ratitude Podcast. I'm so excited. This is, I think, the 11th episode, so I've done 10 episodes just by myself. So you had to endure just me, and now I've got a guest, and I'm so excited about my first guest. This is Matt Morrow, Vegas Matt, as he's now known as, and I met Matt uh, just a few years ago at a uh, an MLM uh, preview meeting for a, a, a company called Live L I V period, and in fact, that's where Live and Rad sort of comes from. Yeah, as uh, that became my company. But Matt came there; he was invited along with another f- mutual friend of ours, or at least a mutual friend of mine. <laughs> And we met there. We became really good friends and have shared some incredible journeys together. The Probably the most memorable is that we went on this car rally in Europe that uh, Matt had a friend that needed a co-driver. And uh, I reached out. We went and had uh, <laughs> stories that we can't talk about, some that we can. But when I think about living rad, living a life where you can just do anything you want, wherever you want, whenever you want, with whoever you want, I think of Matt Morrow. He has inspired me so much just by watching what he's done in his life. He leads an incredible life. Um, he uh, graduated from UCSB. I'm coming to you from Santa Barbara right now. And uh, and then went to work. We're going to talk about this. But he is in the MLM Hall of Fame. I didn't even know there was one of those, but he's in it. <laughs> and one of the things I learned from Matt in a, uh, in a pool in Monte Carlo was that whatever you're doing, whatever you're doing, just do it great. Do it fun. Do it magically. And that if you join an MLM, that, uh, you know, it's really just a business. How, how do you say that, Matt? A business opportunity or making money with a business opportunity or personal development with a business opportunity. That's what it is. <laughs> personal say, development. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you, I used to be an introvert. I know a lot of people don't believe this, but I was such a big introvert. I started coming out of that when I entered the Tony Robbins world, which, by the way, Matt Morrow worked for Tony Robbins back in the day. He's just like the coolest guy there is. <laughs> and uh, then when I met Matt and got into uh, some network marketing, I found that in order to be successful, I had become more extroverted, more aligned, more high vibration. And then it became kind of easy to do quite truthfully. But a lot of my successes were because of Matt Morrow and the time he spent with me. He's just such a giving guy in that he's just got magical wisdom in him from living life. And so I want to just start out with, first of all, welcoming and thanking Matt for being here and just honoring you for the uh, the impact you've had in my life. I'm so appreciative to you, Matt. Well, likewise, you inspire me in every way, particularly your tan. You make me feel very, <laughs> very pale in comparison here. You know, it's funny. I can't think of any stories from the car rally that we couldn't talk about, but uh, <laughs> there, that was, you know, that, that was an interesting one. I was, uh, this morning I was in my daily steam shower and cold plunge ritual and I was, thinking about this podcast that I'm so grateful that you asked me to be on. And, you know, I I was thinking of a quote that everything is how you see it and nothing else matters. For some reason that came to me. Like, I think both you and I are just a couple of just normal, you know, fun, loving, maybe mildly dorky guys that some people think are like the most incredible people in the world. And then maybe some who know us well think, oh, my God, what a mess. You know, we're just we're just two guys just going through life, having fun, doing our best. And everything is how you see it. Nothing else matters. Like I could probably build a case for both you and for me that we're just the coolest, greatest, most wonderful boy. If everyone could just be like us, it would just be great. I could build that case. I could also build a case for man. I wouldn't you wouldn't want to trade places, you know, with us. No one is perfect. And, and, and so the car rally was such an interesting 
example of that because like we could say like, oh my God, we were in these amazing supercars and we started in London at this incredible castle and there were supermodels and champagne and then we drove through Italy and Paris and all the way to Ibiza where we went on a fabulous yacht and you know I mean that's one version another version is is like you were a co-pilot to a guy who turned out to be like a complete psycho case your uh, <laughs> McLaren or whatever it was that you were driving had no air conditioning <laughs> and I was, you know what I mean it was like what do you choose to focus on in life and I think you get what you focus on but looking back I love to choose the version about how, what an incredible experience that ride was. And it's very much similar to life. You know, you're always going to have those moments where your air conditioning goes out or your car gets seized in Spain or uh, whatever the case may be. But then, of course, we remember most fondly the the, the being on top the Nikki Beach Club uh, in that pool in Monaco, sitting there just pontificating about – how wonderful life is when you have your personal development in order and so forth. So, you know, we've had some great times and I just turned 60 years old. I had a big birthday bash that I was so happy that you were able to attend. You know, happy you know, birthday again. Yes. Yeah, it was fun. And, you know, had over a hundred of my closest friends from all over the world fly in and, you know, just pay tribute to 60 fun, incredible years and ups and downs and sideways and all arounds of life. But you know, it is, it is fun and it is what you make of it. And another thing I thought of when I was thinking about the podcast, because like both you and I, it seems like we just do whatever we want. And how is it that, you know, one minute you're in Malibu and the next minute you're in Naples and the next minute you're in Croatia. And, you know, and same with me, like I've got places in Croatia or not Croatia, uh, Costa Rica and Colombia and Arkansas on the lake and Minnesota and Las Vegas. And, you know, we just, it's like, wait a minute, if you just decide you want to up and go on a cruise with Joe Dispenza, you just can. And every week you're somewhere else. And it's like, yeah, it's like, that's how we have it set up. And I think that a lot of people don't realize that you could do whatever you want. Yeah, man. So you, you are this way now, but how did you develop? You know, you're a, a young guy, an accountant, I think it was. And then somehow you became this magical person. Tell, tell our audience a little bit about your evolution in your thinking process. Maybe it starts before that. I don't know. Well, it's like you give me a lot of latitude there, Mr. Yes. Ratitude. <laughs> uh, well, it was the same kind of thing. I mean, a lot of people probably don't know that you were an engineer at Exxon at one time in your life. You know, I mean, you know, a nine to five or probably a seven to seven, you know, 12 hour a day engineer, you know, figuring out how to whatever you do at Exxon, you know. And right. uh, so I started off. I mean, I think you know, all of our stories probably go back to childhood, you know, and if you want to really, really go deep. And so I, I had, uh, I think my mom was a really big influence. I think on one hand, she was the greatest salesman that ever lived. And she really helped me learn that you can get whatever you want if you're committed to your intention. And she also was really a little bit on the overprotective side, which, which shaped me in that she really tried to keep a damper on fun. And she was like, you know, she was the type of mom where if like I had a friend sleep over and then we were on a roll having all kinds. And I'm like, hey, can Jimmy sleep over again tonight? She's like, no, had a sleepover last night. You know, and like don't want to have too much fun. Always trying to throttle it back. And I think our intentions were honorable. But what it did is it made me just have a complete aversion to authority. And, mm. and I just did not like people telling me what I can and can't do and putting a limit on my fun. So I went to college and had a lot of fun in college. Then I got out of college and I, and I was told I had to get a job. And that was kind of what you did after college. And so I got a job as it wasn't an accountant, but I was a banker. You were close. And, and I had okay. a nine to five with a suit and tie. And I went to work at a bank and literally I felt like I was in a prison. And I made it for 18 months and every day was torture. Like an eight hour day seemed like 80 hours. I just was like a, what are, what are those, uh, an orca in a sea world pool or a, a, you know, a, a lion in a cage. I just did not feel right in that environment. And after about 18 months, you know, despite my parents, uh, 
You know, I mean, they were like, you're crazy. You shouldn't quit your job. I went to Hollywood and pursued a job in the movie business as an actor, comedian, producer for a few years. And that was interesting. And I learned a lot. I learned how hard the movie business is. And I learned that you don't just wave a magic wand and become Brad Pitt or John Candy or some kind of a hybrid in between. And then I landed in the wild and wacky world of MLM. So I went from regular job to try to be in the movie business, made four movies, lost about $7 million uh, of friends and family money that we raised, learned some valuable lessons. And then I found myself just broke. And going, oh, my God, were my parents right? You know, am I going to be a complete failure because I didn't take a traditional path? And I bumped into a guy named Al Krause at a breakfast meeting, like one of those mixers where you go if you're trying to figure out what you want to do, like a chamber of commerce mixer. You kind of go, hi, I'm Matt Ball. And, you're, you know, and, and he introduces himself, great guy, very likable. And he said, oh, I got a business you'd be so great at. And he was very animated. He spoke with his hands. And he, and he invited me to an MLM meeting. And I, like everybody else, said, oh, it's a pyramid scheme, not for me, blah, blah, blah. Then he explained to me how it works. And I'm like, that actually makes a lot of sense. And so instead of spending money on advertising, they pay us for word of mouth advertising. And so it's not a pyramid because like a product costs a dollar and then you sell it for two dollars and you pay 50 cents out to the people who sold it instead of paying 50 cents for advertising. Oh, that actually makes a lot of sense. He goes, oh, my God. Yeah. And imagine if you just got five people and they each got five people and they each got five. And he goes, if you brought me five people tomorrow. And then the next day they brought five, you'd have how many? And I said, 25. And he goes, and if those 25 brought five the next day, you'd have how many? 125. And he goes, if they brought five the next day, 625. And I go, well, it couldn't be that easy. He goes, well, it's not as easy as it sounds to get five good people. He goes, but you seem like a pretty challenging guy. I know lots of people. I'll get you five people that want to make a lot of money. And so I didn't know it was supposed to be hard. And I just was wonderful at it. And I made millions and lived happily ever after. That's the condensed version. Exactly. I, you know, I tell people you made $500 million in MLM. I know you told it it's a little bit less, but less. that's my so, story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> no, 20, I, I think rough numbers, 20 million in a little over like 34 years. So I was, I was a mid six figure income earner. Now, like, I don't want to pigeonhole your podcast. I was on a podcast, as a matter of fact, a couple of days ago, I've been doing a lot of them because of this Vegas map thing that I did accidentally in retirement has gotten so big. I have over a million followers now on social media and I, I gamble on slot machines for a living and I've totally retired from MLM and it seems like a, an eternity ago. I think it's a great personal development business. Like you just said, it's a personal development business with an opportunity attached. People say it's get rich quick and they try to make it sound easy. I think it's about the hardest thing you can possibly do. It is very, very difficult. Most people get a rude awakening that they do not have many people in their life that have a, enough respect for their opinion to follow them in to something. And so people say MLM doesn't work. The reality is most people's lives don't work and they realize they have no influence. And so then they have to become a better person, become a person of influence, become the type of person that someone would be afraid not to follow. And it's that growth, because until you're the kind of person someone wants to follow, you ain't going to get no one to follow you. But if you can- So take, Matt, how ahead. do you do that? What's your advice to someone on how you become that person? Well, Robert, as you know, since you're that type of person, I, I mean, I think it's trial and error. Again, I was, I, I gave a lot of, cause I used to have a mad respect for you, man. I mean, you are one of my idols. And, and I was, I was today, I was also thinking about that. Like, what do you have to do? Like, what specifically could I tell people? And I don't like when these motivational speakers, they give these absolutes and people think that they have to do a certain, like the, you have to get up and do 500 push ups and do a cold plunge in 30 below zero water. Like I did a mild exaggeration even in today's interview thus far. Like I take a steam every day. Now at the end of my steam, I run cold water from my shower over me that's maybe 65 degrees. Now that's my idea of a cold plunge. And I think it's that kind of like doing it your way that at least has defined what has been led me to be successful my way. There are no absolutes. Anyone who tells you that they know everything, 
run. They don't. They don't know everything. Even people like Tony Robbins or Joe Dispenza, speaking of people who we have an enormous amount of respect for, or Wim Hof, the breathing guy, or and he's like the cold plunge guy too, or yes. Joe Rogan, or Barack Obama, or whoever your idols are, these people all have human frailties. They all have insecurities. They all have vulnerabilities. They're all just like you and me. None of them are any better than you listening. None of them are you, or you, Robert, or me. And none of them are any worse or any better. They're just people going through the human condition and doing their best. I think that if you realize that, that, you know, that no one's any better than you and you're not better than anyone else and we're all just people and treat them the way you want to be treated and blah, 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 the stuff we learned in kindergarten. Then from that point, okay, I'm, I'm balanced in that. What do I want to accomplish in my life? You have to get clear on that. That was something Tony really helped me with. And I heard you say a Tonyism that I've, I adapted in 1989 or 90. He goes, what's your definition of success? Because I said I wanted to be successful. He says, what, how will you know when you get there? Most people want to be successful, but they have no way of knowing when they're going to get there. So his definition of success that I stole from him was being able to do what I want, when I want, as much as I want, and doing something that helps other people. So I, I kind of adopted that, and I made that my life's mission towards becoming successful. And then magically, I now and for the last 30 years that I can remember, do whatever I want, whenever I want, as much as I want, with whoever I want, and I do my best to help other people along the way. Do your best and and you know and you got to do something you can't just sit there and you know try to meditate it maybe you can uh, maybe you can with your dispensive breathing or something but you can you know meditate it into existence but i think you got to get out there and hustle and you got to learn and you got to do stuff and you got to fail forward and as long as you're failing forward you're gaining on it and so forth and then just believe that you can do it and again you must have a def definition of what is it what is it you're trying to accomplish? In MLM, it was always, I want to get to this level. I need to have a team of 1,000 or 5,000 or 10,000. I need to do a million or 2 million or 10 million of volume. And I would, you know, that all starts with making that one sale and getting that one customer and then the second customer and the third customer and then the first recruit. And I mean, God, so many lessons I learned in MLM. Because as you know, it's harder than hell. You, you sign someone up. Yay! The next day they call you and they quit because their spouse told them it was a scam. It is so hard. And if you can succeed at MLM, you can succeed at anything. All my friends that were successful at MLM that went on to other businesses are now like 100 millionaires, even billionaires. Mine's a good example. I got into this YouTube thing. I make more money now than I ever made in MLM by a factor of at least 3x. And I've only been doing it for two years and it's effortless. All I do is I get on camera and I film myself gambling and I tell dad jokes and I banter with my son and I'm having the time of my life. So after a while, you build up those success muscles and anything you set your mind to, you can do. So long answer. Yeah, no, no, I appreciate that, man. So if, if you were to just give some advice to a, a, a 30, 40 year old person that has, uh, started their career and it may not be going to, to the levels that they want. And for guys, maybe they're approaching the tunnel. I'm coaching someone right now that's in the tunnel. I don't know if people have heard that it's from yeah. Alison Armstrong. It's uh, sort of like the midlife crisis, but it's a little bit different. Uh, it's when guys, because we, we evolve sort of linearly, unlike women who evolve, boom, 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 boom. We just kind of go like this. And it's, it's before when we're moving from a prince to become a king and, and most people don't make it. If you were taking a, uh, you know, kind of a, a midlife person and they want to do something different, they want to live the life that Matt does, Vegas Matt does, that gratitude is, what what just give us some stuff about what you would suggest that they do like concrete things that they do like stuff you told me in the pool in monte carlo <laughs> well again i don't want to just be too esoteric but i guess it would depend on their situ i don't know if esoteric is the right word but it sounded very sophisticated but i, I very like generic it, it would so much of it would depend on who it was that I was coaching. You know, what is their situation? You know, I mean, if 
you know, reality is you got to pay the bills. You know, you got to have, you got to survive. Like that's the lowest base level need. So you can't just be a Pollyanna and ignore your survival and just say, okay, I'm going to go buy a plane ticket to Paris and just wing it. I mean, you can, but not maybe if you're married and have two kids and you, you, you they need to eat. Uh, so there's depending there, you know, everyone's journey is different, but you know, you okay, so to- let me give you a few. Let me give you a few because okay. let's. Um, there's a 40 year old guy who's married, has a, a nine year old daughter, um, has a reasonable job. He's not happy with it, but it pays the bills. What do you tell him to do if he wants to leave an extraordinary life? I always found, and this is interesting, because like I've struggled with my uh, my weight. You know, a weird thing in this country, we have too much food. You know, and uh, other countries, you know, wish they had that problem. But I I have found that whenever I'm down, you know, Tony Robbins says motion creates emotion. So one thing I've always noticed is whenever I started focusing on moving my body and physical exercise and you know, just whether it's a treadmill or a stairmaster or a bike or going on hikes or lifting weights or doing yoga or just anything consistent and I started to feel better stand up straighter taller feel a little muscle starting to develop a little bit more endurance and so forth what I found is that if you raise one area of your life, the vibration in one area of your life, all of the areas tend to raise the, uh, up. So if you, if one thing is to start with is start taking better care of yourself. Okay. So maybe, you know, I don't know if this particular example, you know, that's an issue for him, but the more energy the person has better sleep, better food, less alcohol, no drugs, et cetera, like obvious stuff, you start to feel more energy. And then I would, then I would coach that person. What do you love to do? This has always worked for me. Do what you love and you'll never work another day in your life and the money will come. Going back all the way till I made that first decision, that entrepreneurial decision to go and be in the movie business. I always knew I wanted to be on stage and be on camera be, and I love to make people laugh. So I chased that dream for a couple of years. It did turn into kind of a nightmare. It didn't work out, but I chased it. I had fun during the process, you know? So, and then I, um, I got into that really into the personal development thing and I became quite good at MLM and I spoke on stages in front of tens of thousands of people and and inspired millions of people and made millions of dollars. And that was, that was really fun. So I learned that being on stage thing was a rush for me. I, as I got older around, I think I was around 50, I started to develop a taste for fine wine, very sophisticated (laughs) red wine, you know, and I got invited to, to meet with a friend who had a wine business, a struggling wine business. And I, I declared that we were going to build the largest wine company in the world. And I just made that declaration and I threw a wine tasting party at my house. And within like 12 or 18 months, we had the largest wine club in the world. I met you during one of my failed endeavors, but I really like traveling. And so I, this company Live that we met during, that their their thing was, hey, Kentucky Derby, uh, Yacht Week in Croatia, uh, uh, Wimbledon, all these incredible bucket list journeys. Why not just get all your friends and go on these journeys and make money traveling the world? Great concept, horrible execution. It failed miserably. After that... My wife's a Pilates teacher and someone said, hey, we've got a yoga, pa- a yoga pants business and it's a pandemic and everyone's wearing yoga pants. Nobody's dressing up. Women are just staying at home, working out and walking around the neighborhood. Why don't we start a yoga pants business? And I got involved in that business very, very early. You joined it in that business and we made a massive success out of women in yoga pants. I mean, who doesn't like that? Then I said, oh, screw it. I've got enough money. I bought enough real estate. I'm retired. So at 57, I decided I'm completely retired. I'm sick of these MLMs going out of business and people let let me down and I have enough money, not enough for a private jet, but I started making excuses about how life was over. I'm almost 60. I'm just going to retire. And then I retired. What I do when I retire, I love gambling. I know that doesn't sound like a real positive thing, but I love gambling. So what did I do every day? I was gambling. I'm playing video poker. I'm hitting royal flushes and I'm losing and I'm winning. I love the adrenaline rush. 
And then all of a sudden, I, my son filmed me doing a victory lap around the casino one time, and I was all animated, and we went to dinner and had 80,000 views on TikTok by the time we got back, and we wow. said, wow, we could make money doing this, and next thing I know, I'm the most recognizable event, and literally the biggest gambling influencer in the world mm. after two years. <laughs> so what do I say? This, this gentleman who's got this job he doesn't like, and he's got the nine-year-old kid, and he's 40 years old, what do you like to do? You know, it, take your passion and figure out some kind of business that you can build around it. And some people say, well, gee, I don't have money. That's a big one that stops a lot of people, right? Mm -hmm. You and I both know that is the silliest thing in the world. There is so much money out there. A funny example is the, you and my interactions. I make a post on Facebook and I say, oh, I got this great deal. I'm at a penthouse I'm buying in uh, Costa Rica. And then, and then you send me a message, go, well, I'll go in on it. And like, what that take? Two seconds? You know, and I didn't even mention it to, and then I just put it out there that I wanted this. And then boom, we invested in it and we buy this penthouse that cash flows very nicely every month. And so now that someone might say, oh, that's easy because you know all these rich people. I don't really think that's the case. I just don't have a limiting belief that there's a scarcity of money. So if I'm this 40-year-old guy and all of a sudden I come up with an idea that I am so passionate about and it's whatever it is that he's passionate about, there are people like you and me and countless others. And I'm not saying call me. I'll invest in your deal because I probably won't even take your call or email if I don't know you. So you have to get to the right people. But that's your job. Who, you meaning you who's listening to this. So, yeah. and you'll find the right people if you have the right passion and purpose, they will just vibrationally come into your life. So there's no shortage of money. There's no, there's no scarcity in your existence. It's not like someone else deserves it more than you do. You get a plan, you believe, and then you start executing, you keep working your job, supporting your daughter and on the side, get your ass in shape, clean up any other messes that you have in your life, get rid of toxic people. and focus on your dream and pretty soon you'll be living it. Yeah. And you are living it, aren't you, Matt? Well, I mean, I'm just trying to keep up with you, but you know, I mean, uh, tell me about Vegas, Matt. That is so interesting. I was born and raised in Las Vegas and, uh, you know, as kids, we used to gamble quite a bit. Um, I remember my dad, when he first came over from Hungary, his very first uh, job is paycheck from the titanium plant. He went to go gamble that paycheck thinking he was going to make a lot of money and he lost the whole thing. Oh no. And I think that uh, that was a huge impact to them because they didn't eat for a while. <laughs> I mean, that's, but that's what generally happens. became Vegas Matt. Mm -hmm. And I, I was there at your 60th birthday party. You got these giant uh, bodyguards following you around, protecting you and chasing <laughs> your wife. And I'm sitting there going like, what did Matt become? Tell us some more about that because I think that is the coolest thing that someone can make money on YouTube or TikTok. I know I've heard about this, but I haven't known anyone until I until you. And you say you made three times as much money doing that. Like, how does that happen? It's it's well, YouTube's amazing. Like, like that. Remember, there's, there's this kid named Mr. Beast who's kind of like an idol. I and I, this kid's amazing. He's got a, a couple hundred million followers on YouTube or something. It's insane. And the money you can make on social media is incredible. Now, everybody wants to do it. But again, anyone can do it. I did it. And so you just have to you know, do it, you know, find something interesting. Now, there, I mean, you look on YouTube. It's, it's amazing. All you got to do is go to YouTube and start or go on TikTok and, and the algorithm will start showing you what you're interested. They know you better than you do. And and there are people that are that are doing well in social media doing everything from documenting their golf to swimming with sharks to their travels. There's this one that this, this kid, I, this, this kid, Mike wild Jude, my wild child, this little, little blonde kid about three or four years old that says the cutest things. And, and they have, she now has 405,000 followers or something like that. And her mom just films her and, and, and she says cute stuff and they're probably making 10, $20,000 a month on TikTok now. Uh, but it, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and the thing with the bodyguards is kind of cool that, that, I mean, that, that was just because I actually started to need them. I just manifested this life and I mean, it's it freaking amazing. You know I mean? I live in a mansion with a circular driveway and a pool. Like everything in my whole life is exactly as it would. It can't happen if you don't envision it. You know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and that birthday party was so fun. Hundreds of friends and hundreds of fans and just laughing and having a good old time. And it all just started because I just, 
you know, enjoy it. And I just started doing it and I didn't have it all planned out in advance. It just kind of happened sort of by accident by gambling. And then my son, who's a super smart, you know, never hurts to have a smart kid. He's, he does all the filming. He does all the editing. He understands, he navigates all the, the roadblocks that come along and believe me, there's plenty. And, you know, so he and I partnered up, which is fun because everyone always says, Oh, I want to spend more time with my family. And then they never really do. Like I work with my son almost 24 hours a day. We're having a blast. So I don't know. This just Vegas mat came along because there were two mats. I used to run in this other group and there was, there was one mat from Colorado. And then there was me, they called him Matt G. They called me Vegas Matt. So when we were coming up with a name for our TikTok channel, I just said, why don't we call it Vegas Matt? And then it just happened and it stuck. And now it's become a major brand. And I mean, I'm doing deals with big major corporations and stuff that will blow my mind. It just happened because I enjoy it. I have fun. I pursued something I liked and I made it, made my vacation a vocation. So I, don't yeah, I remember when you when you're first starting out, you told me your vision of of Vegas Bad or what you wanted to do there. Do you remember what it was? I, I don't actually, but uh, probably it was, something- it was it, it was something to do with a limousine and uh, driving around Vegas and pulling up and all sorts of people there, and, uh, and you're doing it. it. Wasn't too far off. I mean, I, I did get the Vegas Matt party bus. But I only gone on it like twice. It ended up being kind of a pain in the neck and people are spilling. And But I mean, it, it, it did come out that way. Like I usually say things like, like I, I like to create big vision statements. You know, I remember with the wine club, I said, I want to create the, the biggest wine club in the world. And and I said, I want to become the biggest gambler in the world. Like I, I like big goals. And again, that's a Tony Robbins thing or any, you know, that stuff's all really obvious. Everyone, you know, go read the right books, go to the right seminars. Look at you, Robert, you're always go you're like high level tony robbins you've been to fiji you've climbed on top of the pole and jumped off and you probably you know held your breath for 10 minutes with joe dispenza or whatever you do with those seminars and you <laughs> you've done it all you're always pushing yourself always growing always thinking bigger and it's just if you change your thinking magically your world changes so much of our existence just only exists in our mind and we create our experience of this life. Yeah. You know, there's a a book and I don't remember the name of it. It's by a professor at Stanford. And she wrote about the difference between a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. And so for someone that has a growth mindset, like you and I, it's, it's not easy, but it's, it's, it's part of the process that we can grow. If you run into someone that has a fixed mindset Is there anything that you could think to do with that person to get them to grow? Ah, you know, what comes up for me, which is always kind of how I do. I mean, certainly the greatest thing I could share with the audience is, I don't freaking know. Who am I to tell anyone what to do is my first instinct to answer kind of like that. But I mean, if I ran into that person, I mean, I guess the question would be like, okay, well, like, why am I investing the energy to try to beat my head against the wall with this person? So what... It sounds like, you know, if someone's like being stuck in the mud and then you're trying to like get them out of the mud, like I might just like instead of trying to pull them out of the mud and then they're pulling the other direction, you end up with this really annoying conversation that's exhausting for both of you. I might look at them and like, are you enjoying, you know, being stuck in the mud? Do you have any interest in a life that's not like that? You know, and and then let, let, well, yeah, I, I guess I don't really like being a negative, you know, black cloud over my head, stuck in the mud arguing person okay well cool let's talk a little bit about how you might want to change you know what i mean like don't argue with people i would just you know get rapport and let go of any attachment to the outcome and i think you could become more effective in coaching a person like that but i would probably look at them and go like how's that working for you and yeah. and then i might and then and I, then i'd either would make because i and again my posture would be understand I don't care. You know, this may be the last time I ever talk to you because people like you, not you, you, this imaginary person we're talking right. about, of course, are exhausting and draining. And I try not to give my energy to that. But you know what? I'm in a giving mood. I got a few minutes. Would you like some help with this? <laughs> you know, how, how I would probably approach that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, as you think about your future, you got May- Vegas Matt going. Is that is that it? Do you have some other dreams, other goals? I know you're going to have some more in the future. Uh, what's next for, for Matt Morrow? 
Uh, you know, it's interesting. Again, back to reality, people. I don't know anything. I'm just a dorky dude going through life like the next guy. I'm super thrilled with what's going on right now. And then I think the reason they call the present the present is because it's a gift. I'm really working on being present because you can spend a lot of your life saying, when I get a girlfriend, I'll be happy. When I get married, I'll be happy. When I get out of college, I'll be happy. When I get married, I'll be happy. When I have kids, I'll be happy. When I have a million dollars in the bank, I'll be happy. When I have this, I'll be happy. And you can spend a whole lot of your life thinking about when in the future you'll be happy when I think a really good coaching for most humans is spend a little time today being happy. And that for me is the growth I think that I'm going through at 60 finally is you know, later today, I have a slot tournament, you know, later today, I'm going to go down and film and later today, I'm going to, you know, probably have another incredible dinner with friends. And tomorrow, I'm going to see a comedian, something I know you enjoy. I'm going to, to a comedy show in Vegas tomorrow night with 12 of my friends to see Theo Vaughn, someone I've never seen. I just seen him on, on Instagram and YouTube and stuff. And he looks really funny. And so I got to go to that. And I'm just kind of present on what's going on you know, today and this weekend. And I'm stoked. I got a couple really big deals that, that if, you know, they all go according to plan, I could achieve my dream of having my own plane, which is, you know, about the only thing materialistically that I haven't done, which I think goes back to my like high school days when I was like not popular. So I've always wanted to prove that I was bigger, better, smarter, stronger, richer than everyone, you know, like a lot of those insecurities, which tend to drive us. But I do want a plane because I hate TSA and I hate flying commercial and I don't like waiting in lines. Uh, so if things go really, really well, like the big, that's another big goal of mine is to start flying private. And uh, just, I want to scale this, this thing, this YouTube thing as big as I can and, you know, help my son and my daughter and my wife, you know, set them up for life and my grandkids for life, my future grandkids. I don't have any yet, but yeah, that's about it. I, I, I couldn't just like say, okay, well, here's my life plan and my goals, Robert, as, as, uh, as taught in the book, think and grow rich. I have it all outlined meticulously day by day. I, sorry. I can't say that. I know I'm kind of just going with the flow and hopefully it goes well. Hey Matt, what are you most proud of in your life? Well, you know, I don't know. That's a tough one. But obviously, okay, one, I've been married for 35 years and I, and, uh, you know, like everything else, not perfect, but I mean, I have an amazing wife. I think I did. I was smart because think about it, like, I know that I would be a mess. Not only would I like this beautiful home, like you should see my Christmas tree. It's already up because I mean, I saw that it looks like it looks like Macy's in my house. Like I mean, I'm so lucky to have a you know beautiful home and two healthy, amazing kids. So luckily, even though I'm a maniac, I have a stable, really nice, awesome, loving family. But that's sort of cliche, but it's true. Like that's the first thing that comes to mind. I'm proud of that. I think there's a lot of luck involved in choosing the right partner there. And then uh, another thing, like you were there too. Like my 60th birthday party was heartwarming. You were at that dinner, I believe. And then you went to your comedy show afterwards, which is fine. All you missed was a cocktail party, a bunch of people drinking. What fun is that? But the dinner part where it was like a hundred and 10 ish. It was only supposed to be a hundred, but it grew in scope. 110 people, all amazing friends. They say most people don't even have enough true friends in their life to carry their casket. Okay. And I'm blessed to have literally over a hundred people that I could say we have a, I love you. You love me. When we go to lunch, it's not like who's going to pay. It's kind of like who gets to pay uh, that I've over a hundred of that level 10 friendship relationships, probably more actually w was with someone the other night that I hadn't seen in a while. And I remember I go, man, I really love this person. And we have uh, so much fun together. I forgot to invite you to my 60th birthday party. It's like, I've got an abundance of friends and health and healthy, good relationships in my life. 
So I think that's something I'm proud of. And that I also think that I said this on a podcast the other day, like I think I'm a pretty nice person. Like I don't <laughs> screw anyone. Like I can walk, go out in public and no one's ever going to be coming up to me and saying like, Oh, you did this bad thing or you, I, I don't have to hide. I, I am an open book. Everything I've ever done, you know, I, I mean, I'm not saying I haven't made mistakes or whatever and I'm perfect, but I'm not afraid of anyone or anything. You know, I've lived a very nice life. I think I've been a good person. I help people. I try to be honest and giving and all those wonderful things. And so I'd say all in all, life hasn't been a 10 out of 10. But I'd say I've got a good solid nine and 90% is an A, A minus in school. So, uh, I don't know. I'm proud of my whole, my whole life, you know, warts and all, but a decent, decent existence. Yeah. And, and one of the things you talked about was uh, early on, you wanted to be a comedian and you're like one of the funniest guys I ever know. Sometimes it kind of offends some of my friends. Sometimes oh, it hurts. I, <laughs> ooh, when? I, I can't believe that. Right. But um, do you have like a joke or jokes that you could kind of close this with that we could end on a, a super funny high <laughs> kind of place? Well, first off, I'd like to explore any of these alleged friends of yours that had their sense of humor surgically extracted from them. Remember, we were at a dinner in Croatia. Okay. And uh, you were talking about something, and I didn't um, attack you or or defend whatever it was. I got in so much trouble that night with all the ladies. Remember that? No. You might not even know. (laughs) It was the white night. You know, we were all dressed up in white. We went to that special dinner. Yeah, I remember. Um, I don't I know. Think you, were talk- you were talking about, uh, I think it was the uh, midget tossing. <laughs> That's funny. I got in trouble for that. I mean, people are so interesting these days. You know, like if you look at the Wolf of Wall Street, which was, a you know, pop culture, Leo DiCaprio, you know, our, yep. the head liberal in the world, uh, you know, there was a. Uh, you know, there was a scene where they, you know, they tossed the dwarfs and the, in the party at the Wolf of Wall Street. And in those, that company that has those actors that, that do the midget tossing for that movie that they hired that were paid super well. There's a guy, I think his name is uh, Joe and uh, no, Mighty Mike. Anyway, I forget. Cool guy though. He was here at my house and he. And then he made a life and he loves the attention and he has so much fun at these parties and he makes good money. I paid the guy a couple thousand bucks to come to a party for half an hour and we had this midget tossing and so forth. And it was an absolute blast. Paid actor, living the dream. You know, a lot of people, maybe if there were a dwarf or whatever, they're depressed and have like an alcohol problem or whatever. Like, they're, I'm sure there's some, some wonderfully happy dwarfs. There's probably some unhappy dwarfs. You know, this one has chosen to become an actor and to do this this thing, uh, this dwarf tossing. And so, like to me, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't, you know, look at it as a human rights violation. But if someone is in a mood and someone has hurt them, and there was some person who maybe I triggered in them, some, you know, bad, you know, sixty-year-old white guy that represents something oppressive and awful to that person who you said was triggered by that conversation, which was nothing more than a conversation or a funny anecdote where no one was harmed during the filming of this movie. And she chose to get wound up. That's her problem, not mine, but that's not a funny, but it is. And it does bother me when people project their anger, their insecurities, their problems on someone else, and they make up a story that is absolutely untrue. So anyone who is offended by any of my humor (laughs) has a tragic problem of their own to deal with. And as far as like, yeah, I've never been the kind of comedian who's like, hey, wind me up, tell me a joke, funny guy. You know, and that's, that's, I believe, why I like stand up. I went up a couple of times and I kind of choked. You know, the environment that I'm the funniest in is when I don't have to be funny. And if you watch my, well, if you go back and look at any tapes from me back in the old days doing MLM meetings, you know, I would crack people up. I didn't have to, because I was really just saying, and this vitamin drink is very good for you. And all you need to do is drink it and get other people to drink it. A pretty stupid, basic message. But I would do that in such a way where I would crack people up 
get their defenses down and then they'd be interested. Like when I'm gambling, all I'm doing is pushing a button and saying, yay, I won or shit, I lost. And, but yet I do it in a way that's funny and you know, you can watch it youtube.com slash Vegas Matt and watch a 20 to 40 minute television program every single day about gambling and jokes. But I haven't, you know, I'm not like, okay, well, this horse walks into a bar and the bartender said, why the long face? You know, I mean, I've got a, uh, got a joke about a little tiny piano player that's pretty funny, but not, I don't know that I'd want to waste people's valuable time telling an old, an old joke. But I think that, I think that, it, you know, life is short. You should laugh. I think it's good. I mean, it's fun to laugh. My friend Jeff that I had dinner with the other night, we laugh so hard. We cry, you know, we get together. That's why we have so much fun. Te- reliving old stories we had together and laughing and life's short, man. I was 16 yesterday and i was 60 october 4th you know i mean it goes by boom fast and we went and saw a carrot top for your birthday carrot top is i know i know you really like him (laughs) now how did you enjoy the show i enjoyed i had no idea because i remember carrot top always advertised in in las vegas but i it, it didn't seem like something that I would uh, uh, go see. And so I was so excited when I did. And it was a riot. It yeah, was funny. so much fun. Um, I, I could see it. I could see you down in the, the near front row and uh, him interacting with you a little bit. And then him showing up for your post uh, com- comedy show uh, party. And that was really cool. We all took pictures with him. It was just fantastic. Everything you do, Matt, is fantastic. Oh, uh, likewise. Well, you know, see, Carrot Top's another good example. Some people are racist against redheads, and they don't realize how he's actually a very, very nice and funny guy. And, uh, yeah, Carrot Top, I think, is the – okay, there, uh, there's two shows in Vegas. If you ever, ever come to Vegas, one is Absinthe. Uh, it's at Caesars. It's a combination of comedy and Cirque du Soleil type stuff. It's the best show. Most A lot of the Cirque du Soleil shows, I'm like – half asleep by the end of it. They seem redundant, but absent is amazing. Carrot Top, funniest show in Vegas. Those are the two best shows in Vegas. And anything else you want to know about Vegas, let me know on VegasMap.com. Uh, we saw Lionel Richie there. It was pretty good too. Oh, that was an amazing show. I've seen it, I think, three times now. I think I've seen it wow. twice with you. Uh, Lionel Richie's a, a, incredible. Yeah, there's someone was set saying that they're going to go see uh, – Oh, I can't remember. But I mean, like every night there's someone there's someone here. I was going to say Billy Idol, but he's not even alive. So it'd be tough to see him. But it was someone like from that era that's playing here. Like every night there's something to do in Vegas. It, it's amazing that uh, during that live conference we were at, uh, uh, Daniela, who was on that uh, cruise and a, another friend and I, we went and saw Aerosmith. And yeah. it, it was in a small little showroom, but the sound system so amazing. I mean, I could see Steven Tyler's face. You know, instead of watching him on that giant screen like you'd normally see in a big stadium, you could see his face. And that was pretty cool. Las Vegas is it. Vegas Matt is it. <laughs> if you go to Vegas, go see Ma- Vegas Matt. Go gamble with him. He's just an amazing guy. Watch his YouTube. Watch his TikTok. I'm on his Instagram. I like it every time. I'd look to see how many people have liked it. It's usually in the thousands. I try to get it a little bit early. Uh, Matt is just amazing. I appreciate you being here, Matt. All the things that that you do, that you say, uh, they just inspire me, and I hope they inspire someone else in our audience. And thank you very much for being here. Well, thanks for having me. And you all the same right back at you. You are living the dream, not just talking about it. All right. With that, we're out. And thank you very much. 